a new generation of games and a new generation of game console one company takes an early leap of faith will it succeed let's take a look at the Sega Saturn What's up YouTube, Retro Gamer Gen X back with another a look at video. And in today's a look at, we're gonna be checking out that console right there, the Sega Saturn. Uh, we'll be taking a look at the history of the console, what's inside of it, what makes it tick, doing a 360 tour of the console itself. And then at the end of the video, I give my thoughts and opinions about the console back in the day. And also in between each segment, I always put in commercials just showing how the console was marketed back then as well. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and take a look, guys. We are five years away from entering the 21st century. Humankind stands on the edge of the interactive age. You have come a long way. But are you ready for the future? Introducing Sega Saturn. Aww. Hit it. Sega's next generation gaming platform, revolutionary sports and arcade gameplay, all with amazing new 3D experiences never before possible on home game systems. Wow. Sega Saturn. you play the game. <laughs> What's happening? What's happening? Sega. Saturn! Go farther than you have ever gone before. Sega Saturn. Play your games in the 21st century and leave the rest of the world behind. <laughs> The story of the Sega Saturn starts in 1992. Sega knew they had to come up with the next-gen video game console to stay competitive in the gaming market. Sega's Haduki Soto headed the development team of the new console codename Project Saturn. By 1993, Sega teamed up with Hitachi to develop a new 32-bit RISC CPU that would be used in the new console. The new processor would be called the Super H RISC Engine, or SH2 for short. The Saturn would be developed around the dual SH2 configuration. Sega was mostly finished with the design of the Saturn by the end of 1993, but info was leaked about the upcoming Sony PlayStation, and Sega decided to add another video display processor to the Saturn to improve 2D performance and 3D texturing too. This gave the Saturn two VDPs as well. During this time frame, Tom Kalaksky didn't like the architecture of the Saturn and wanted to go with supercomputer maker Silicon Graphics for its 3D chips and design. Sega of Japan didn't like this idea. Nintendo later contracted with Silicon Graphics for the development of the N64. Also in 1993, Sega restructured its internal game studios to better suit development of 3D games. They enlisted Team Andromeda, which were part of the arcade development team, to design 3D games for the new console. In early 1994, the Sega Titan arcade system came to be based off the Saturn's architecture, a claim being the developer for it in the United States. In early 1994, per orders of Sega of Japan, Sega of America started development of the 32-bit add-on for the Sega Genesis called the 32X. 
This was to be a transitional device between the Genesis and the Saturn, for people who could not afford the upcoming Saturn. It would use much of the same hardware as the Saturn, such as the SH2 CPUs, but would be incompatible. Sega of America President Tom Kalaski did not like the idea of the 32X, wanting to instead get at least another year of life out of the Genesis with no more add-ons. He just saw it as a bad idea, but Sega continued on with the development of the two 32-bit systems that would launch at the same time in 1994, the Saturn in Japan and the 32X in North America. The Saturn released in November of 1994 in Japan with the pack-in game of Virtual Fighter. The initial 200,000 units were sold out in the first day. Sega waited to release more units to the market until December 3, 1994, the day the PlayStation released in Japan to stymie their sales. By the time 1994 was over, Sega had sold more than 500,000 units, while the PlayStation had only sold 300,000 units. This did not last long though, as the sales of the PS1 took off in 1995, leaving the Saturn behind. Sony started to attract more third-party developers due to the cheap licensing fee of only $10 and a well-designed development kit. In March of 1995, Kalansky announced the Saturn would be launched September 2nd in the United States. However, Sega of Japan wanted the console to be released earlier. During the E3 show on May the 11th, Kalansky announced the release of the Saturn for the price of $399. 30,000 units were shipped out to Toys R Us, Babbage's, Electronics Boutique, and Software Etc. and available for sale that day. This enraged other retailers that were not advised of the release. Stores such as Best Buy, Walmart, and KB Toys stopped selling Sega products because of this. During the E3 show, PlayStation announced they would release their console at a price of $299 to the applause of the crowd. For some of you uh, might actually want to know what that price is. <laughs> uh, and uh, since it's a beautiful day here in Los Angeles, uh, I'm going to ask Sony Computer Entertainment President of America, Steve Race, to join me for a brief presentation. Two ninety nine. All this started to make Sega look bad. With its release in the US, only six games were ready with the pack in game Virtual Fighter. This game was not as popular in the United States as it was in Japan, making more people wait for the PlayStation release. People started to compare games such as Daytona USA versus Ridge Racer on the PlayStation. There was a noticeable difference with Ridge Racer being almost arcade quality, while Daytona USA was just not as good as the arcade. In October, Sega announced a price reduction of the Saturn to $299, the same as the PlayStation. However, not to be outdone, Sony announced in May of 1996 another price reduction to $199. The next day, Sega announced their price reduction to the same amount as the PlayStation's. But for Sega, they were now losing money on each console they sold. By 1995, Sega still accounted for 40% of the US gaming market, but with the arrival of the PlayStation, things were taking a dramatic swing. By 1996, Kalansky, which wanted to just continue on with the Genesis until the launch of the Saturn, wanted out of Sega. He left in September of 1996, and that started a shakeup at Sega of America. Several people either quit or moved positions as Sega of America was being reformed. Also in 1996, Sega of America STI team was developing a new 3D Sonic game for the 32X, but since the 32X was being discontinued, it was now to be released on the Saturn. The game was to be called Sonic Extreme, and to be a fully immersive 3D world, a first for a Sonic game. The game was being rushed to be completed by December of 1996, However, the lead programmer quit and several of the other team members got sick and it was apparent that the game would not be completed by December. Sega canceled the game. Not long after this, the STI team was disbanded. With the cancellation of Sonic Extreme, a lack of third-party developers being harder to develop for and retailers refusing to sell Sega products 
were all nails in the Saturn's coffin. Sony had taken the lead in the market share for gaming consoles in the US, leaving Sega behind. By 1997, Sony had 47%, Nintendo 40%, and Sega only 12% of the gaming market. By 1998, Sega was almost ready to release the next game console. With sales of the Saturn not doing well in the US and Europe, they decided to call it quits on the Saturn in those regions. It did continue on in Japan for a couple more years until the year 2000 when it was cancelled there too. The Sega Saturn had a six year lifespan being released in Japan in 1994 and discontinued in the year 2000, selling 9.26 million units worldwide. The console is considered to be a failure by Sega due to the early release in the US, not enough games at launch, and disagreements internally at Sega leading to bad business decisions. Welcome to the theater of the eye. Rods and cones, report to the orbital side. How nice. We're trimming the toenails. What's that? Uh. Optic nerve. This is the brain. What's going on down there? Uh. The airdrop's going off! Go get him! We're having a breakdown. 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 What else can go wrong? Surgeon Synapse on line two, it's the sphincter. What is going on up there? Sega Saturn. Now let's take a look at the inside of the Sega Saturn. There's a lot to go over in this one, as the Saturn was a pretty powerful machine for its time. During its production run, there were several revisions of the motherboard made. I would love to go over them all, but due to time restraints, I will just go over the revision VA8. So keep in mind that the chips, the layouts, and all that may be different on your board if you have a different revision, but the architecture is still the same board to board. First we will start with the CPUs. There's actually three CPUs in this machine, two for the system and one for the sound control. The Saturn had two Hitachi SH2 CPUs running at 28.6 MHz. These were the main CPUs of the system running at 56 MIPS. Also there was a Motorola 68000 CPU running at 11.3 MHz used to control sound preventing bottlenecking in the system's CPUs. It worked in conjunction with the Saturn's custom sound processor to produce the system sounds. Next, the Saturn had two VDPs, or Video Display Processors. You could call these the GPUs of the Saturn. VDP-1 controls sprite and polygons, and VDP-2 handles the backgrounds. VDP-1 ran at 26.8 MHz and had a color palette of 32,768 colors, including polygon texture mapping, lighting, shading, and wireframe capabilities. It could render 200,000 to 800,000 polygons or 140,000 to 300,000 textured polygons and 226 sprites per scan line. It also had a maximum screen resolution of 1024 by 256. VDP2 ran at 57.2 MHz and had a color palette of over 16 million colors. With 2D scrolling and 3D rotating backgrounds, tile capabilities, and produced visual effects such as water, fire, and fog. Now we will look into the sound chip for the Saturn. It used a proprietary Saturn Custom Sound Processor, or SCSP for short. It had an integrated Yamaha FH1 chip inside and was capable of producing 32 channels of audio in four formats, PCM, FM, MIDI, and LFO. The Saturn is like most game consoles with its own system ROM. The ROM pictured below is labeled Sega NPR 17941MX and is a 512 kilobyte system BIOS ROM. The system had a lot of RAM on board. Well, let's take a look at where it is and what it goes to. First, the system RAM. There is 12 megabits of RAM dedicated to just the system. 
Pictured here is the NEC D489020GF-A15, a 8 megabit chip and two M5 M44260 CJs. There are four megabit RAM chips. Also on the front side of the board, we have 256K of RAM for battery backups labeled UM62257M-70. Now we'll flip the board over to reveal more RAM chips. First let's go over the video RAM. This consists of 5 chips totaling 12 megabits. There are 4 2 megabit HM5221605 TT17S chips and one 4 megabit HM524165 CTT17S chip. Next is the sound RAM. This chip is a 4 megabit HM514270 CJ7 chip. And at last we have the CD buffer RAM. This is a 4 megabit M5M44260CJ chip. Now that leaves us with just a few more chips I think are important enough to talk about. First is the system control unit. This chip labeled Sega 315-5966 is really like the PLA chip in a C64. It controls the whole works and makes everything work with one another. Next is the system manager peripheral controller. This chip labeled Sega 315-5744 is really just an I.O. chip for the controllers and other peripherals in the system. Last we have two chips that control the CD-ROM. The first one labeled YGR019B is the microcontroller for the CD-ROM mechanism. It controls the operation of the CD-ROM itself. The last chip labeled HD643097F is the CD controller. This chip basically handles all the audio, video, and code coming from the CD and buffers it so the system can read the data. So that basically does it for this to look inside. There are a few other chips on the board, but most of these are the common LS74 chips and such. But as you can see, gone are the days of the simple game console with the off-the-shelf parts. Things are getting more complex as we move into the 3D gaming world. There's never been a game like Sega Saturn's Nights. Never been a game that's allowed you to fly fluid and free in real-time 3D. Never not anywhere, but especially not on that other system. Simply because, with only one processor, it doesn't have the power to do it. Fly, Playthink, fly. You're not ready. Yeah, Sega! All right, guys, so let's go ahead and take the 360 tour of the Sega Saturn here. So as we can see here, this is a Model 1 Sega Saturn. How you can tell, I have the oval buttons, where the uh, Model 2 has the circular buttons. So that's kind of how you can tell the difference there. Uh, but this is the power button. This is the reset button. This opens up the disc tray, or disc flap, I guess you would call it. Uh, we have high octane in here. It's kind of a cool game. Uh, I'll probably do that during the gameplay section. Uh, here's your controller, port 1 and 2. On the sides, there's really nothing but just vents. And on the bottom, same thing, just vents and system information. On the back here, we have the expansion bay, which I'm missing the little panel here, unfortunately. Uh, but then you have the little CMOS battery in there. to That basically saves your uh, time and date and game saves and stuff like that uh, with this battery. And then you have the AV out power and then this is the communications port and what that is used for is you could actually buy a link cable and connect two Saturns together and play some of the supported games that did that. So that's pretty much it for the Saturn there guys but I did want to show you this as well. So we have the controller here. I'm gonna go ahead and plug it in and as you guys can see here this is just the Sega Saturn controller. So you have a D-pad, start, shoulder buttons, and the six buttons here. A, B, C, X, Y, and Z, I think it is. Isn't it X, Y, and Z? Yep. <laughs> so I used to love this controller. I think this is probably one of the better controllers back in the day uh, for fighting games and things like that. 
So, but anyway, guys, let's go ahead and get this thing powered on and we'll do a little bit of gameplay here. Oh, my God. 
カズマ様綾殿はすでに我らがアジトにお連れしたご安心を将はすぐに現れるはずだこの右京左京影の務めに寸分の誤りもございます肉を切り裂く華麗なる剣の舞い即とご覧くださいリダはパワーを作り出す。アスタールの目的は、守るリダ。アスタールを守るのは、時々と時々。そして、それを見つけたのは、それを見つけたのは、それを見つけたのは、After creating this world, Antawas slept and didn't see the danger to come. As she slept, the evil god Gerardo stole her creation. He sought to change the world to suit his wicked tastes, but Lita and Estal resisted. So Gerardo made his own human, Geist, and told him to destroy Lita. Geist took Lita to the bottom of the sea. アスタール pursued them in a rage. In his desperation to rescue Lita, アスタール cracked the bottom of the ocean. Lita was free, but the ocean was ruined. The battle awakened Antawas. When she saw what アスタール had done, she banished him. But Lita took pity on アスタール and gave him her jewel. After banishing a star, Antoas battled Gerardo and defeated him. And Antoas slept again.
Lots of good reasons to go with Sega Saturn instead of Nintendo. We call them games. Sega Saturn has tons of them. Nintendo has just a few. It does beg the question: Do you want to play or twiddle your thumbs? Face it, Nintendo, you weren't worth waiting for. Alright guys, so we've come to the end of the video here where I give my thoughts and opinions about the system here itself, the Sega Saturn, and what can I really say about the Sega Saturn? I loved it and I enjoyed it. Um, at the time, I had the Sega Genesis, the 32X, the Sega CD, a Game Gear, so it was a no-brainer for me to go ahead and switch over to get the Saturn when it released. Um, and just seeing the 3D games and the graphics and, you know, the polygon graphics and 3D environments and all that and kind of shifting away from the 2D, you know, sprite world that we had been living in since the 80s, 70s and 80s. I mean, it was just amazing to me to see what that system could do. Um, now, unfortunately, it didn't turn out to be that successful for Sega, selling just over 9 million units. In my eyes, that's still kind of successful, but in the game console world, unless you sell 20, 30 million units, it's not considered it a success. Um, but it did have great games, like you see up here is Resident Evil uh, that the PlayStation had. It had uh, Tomb Raider. It had basically all the other games that the other consoles had, plus its Sega exclusives like Daytona USA and... Just other games like that, Virtual Fighter and other things too. Um, I love the system. Like I said, unfortunately for me though, is by 1997, I saw Gran Turismo come out on the PlayStation and that just amazed me. Just the graphics and the physics and no other racing game on the Saturn could even match that. So I went out and bought a PlayStation, got Gran Turismo, started playing that. And unfortunately the Sega kind of took a... Uh, a back seat at that point and when the Dreamcast came out I didn't buy that I waited for the PlayStation 2 to come out to purchase that at that time so you know Sega really lost my confidence after the 32X just simply because I bought into the whole hype of the 32X and then literally at like a year after I bought it it was canceled no more games were coming out only 40 games were published and to me, that kind of killed it for me and I kind of saw the same thing almost happening with the Saturn it seemed like they weren't getting all the good titles like the PlayStation was getting. 
So like I said, at that point, it kind of took a back seat. And Sega, for me, as a console maker, took a back seat at that point as well. And from that point on, I just went PlayStation exclusively. Unfortunately, but uh, memories of the system are just great. I, I loved it. My friends used to come over and play this. I had an apartment at the time. I remember just getting down on Madden and NBA, um, what was it, NBA action, something like that. I think it was NBA action or something like that. Some kind of basketball game we were always playing on that. And of course, Resident Evil and just all the different games that were on there until I got the PlayStation and that basically changed everything. But anyway, guys, I'm going to go ahead and get out of here. I just wanted to thank all my subscribers for subbing to me and watching the videos. If you haven't subbed yet, go ahead and click that little subscribe button. If you like the content, hit like. And also, if you do sub, go ahead and click that bell as well. That way you guys get uh, notifications every time I drop new content like this. So I'm going to go ahead and get out of here. Y'all have a great one. Peace out, y'all. Game over, man. It's game over.